Today we're going to be talking about logical languages, their use and development. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the earth and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living teacher, that was the name thereof. Now this for me is a fascinating quote because it gives the faculty of language to humans, to man, to Adam. God does not come down and give Adam the ability to speak. He gives Adam the world and he in turn names it with, with his own classification. This is a fascinating look into what, how we perceive language and how we perceive the world around us and how we perceive our own cognition. Um, and this is actually a very controversial quote because if you ask a philosopher or a theologian or a philologist in the 17th, 16th, 14th centuries, um, what, what language a child would grow up speaking if you gave him no linguistic input whatsoever, they would have all said Hebrew because they believed that the language of Adam was Hebrew. Not everybody agreed with this. There were some people who thought it was German. There were some people who thought it was Swedish. There were some people who thought it was French because they were Europeans and Europeans like their own languages. Um, <laughs> but, but, but overall, uh, the idea was that it was Hebrew. Um, but not everybody agreed that Hebrew was a perfect language. Uh, John Wilkins, uh, he created an a, a essay on the real character of a uh, philosophical language. Um, he said, okay, so maybe Adam spoke Hebrew, but we all know the story of the Tower of Babel. We all know about the corruption of tongues. We all know, um, and he spoke English, so he knew especially well, <laughs> that uh, languages are arbitrary and sometimes don't make a lot of sense. And he said, okay, so we've discovered new continents. We know we've established all these great civilizations. He was a child of the age of enlightenment. And he said, why can't humans just develop a better language? You know, we, we engineer all these great things. Why can't we engineer language? Um, so he came up with 600 pages of what essentially boiled down to tables. Um, just tables and tables and tables and tables of uh, different classifications of things. Um, and I took a look at this book and it is an impressive effort, but it does have some certain degrees of arbitrariness to it. Like here's his term for our, um, an armadillo. It is an animal that bleeds. Uh, it is a beast that is rapacious, so it's a uh, carnivorous. It is a dog kind, and what he thinks dog kind means is that its skull is oblong. Um, uh, feeding on ants, but it, there's two types of animals that feed on ants. It's armadillos and ant bears. I don't know what an ant bear is, but apparently he knew. Uh, with crustaceous covering. Uh, and he gave every little one of these things a different letter, and you put them together, and zato. That's what an, that's what an armadillo is to him. Um, Jorge Borges, uh, Jorge Luis Borges in the 20th century, uh, later made fun of this by, I'm sorry, I don't lose my memory, so he came up with a fictitious Chinese encyclopedia in which all the animals were categorized as those pertaining to the emperor and bald ones, trained ones, sucking pigs, sirens, fabulous ones, stray dogs, those included in this classification, those that shake like crazy, innumerable ones, those drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc. Those that just broke the base, and those that look like flies from a distance. Um, now, this is a very scathing critique of John Wilkins' essay. Although Borges was, like me, fascinated by um, the complexity and the sort of logical uh, continuity of his essay. Um, Picture there is not John Wilkins. That's a little bit. Uh, misleading, I'm sorry, that is actually uh, Gottfried Le Leibniz. Uh, and he looked at this and he also said, this is completely arbitrary. Why are we basing this on classification and on tables instead of on logic? Now Leibniz was a very good mathematician. He came up with binary calculus. And if you don't know what binary calculus is, it's okay, I don't either. But this guy came up with it. Um, <laughs> and, he, uh, and he decided that, um, you know, why don't we develop logic symbolically, right? Um, and so he sort of kind of came up with a way of doing, it was, it was based on what he thought Chinese characters were, uh, which was like uh, an, an exact description of what they were showing, um, which is a little bit of an idealist view on it, but whatever. And he said, um, well, let's do the same thing with every language. And it did not take off. Neither did John Wilkins' essay on the real character of so on and so forth, uh, because partially because of the French Revolution, showed everybody that the Enlightenment has its, you know, its limits, uh, and also because there was less time to be sitting around talking about philosophical languages. Um, 
but they do have certain effects on us today. Uh, binary calculus, again, was developed from his Caracteristica Universalis, his, character, his definition of everything. Uh, the Dewey Decimal System that we see in the library right here is inspired in part from the essay of John Wilkins. Um, in 1786, uh, the guy to your right, uh, this is Sir Williams Jones. He was a British person, and as British people were wont to do during the 18th century, he went to India, and he, and he heard about Sanskrit, and he started noticing these strange little coincidences between the Sanskrit word for one, two, three, the Sanskrit word for mother, the Sanskrit word for father, the English words for the same things, the Latin words for the same things, the German, the uh, uh, Greek words and the German words and so on, all the Adamic languages, they all sounded like Sanskrit somehow. Um, and he said, you know what, maybe they're, maybe they're all come from the same source. He did not know this at the time, but he had actually come up with a systematic study of languages and of human uh, communication, which is now known as linguistics. Uh, linguistics had a heyday later on in the 20th century where the people to your left, that is Sapper and Worf, Benjamin Lee Worf and uh, Edward Sapper, came up with the Sapper-Worf theory. Uh, this basically says that language determines thought, right? Uh, it, it has some ugly racial under or overtones, um, but it's still in its weaker form, it's still considered, you know, applicable today. The strong form that they came up with was not. Um, that's pretty much disproven. But in the 1950s and in the 1960s, when Sapper and Worf were working, um, this was all the rage, and everybody was like, oh, the Sapper-Worf theory, uh, let's find out more about it, and let's test it, right? Because linguistics is a science, and science is deserves to be tested, right? Um, and so someone came up with a particular idea. He said, okay, how about we just sign a language completely unlike any language you see today, teach it to people, and see if their thought process changes, their cognition changes. Uh, he came up with Loglan. Uh, Logland is short for logical language, and it is based on the ideals of predicate logic. Um, he actually tried to, you know, um, trademark it, right? He tried to patent it. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, you can't trademark a language. It's not for your personal property. And this actually uh, is more of an issue than it sounds like because there were some of his followers, some of the people who looked at this really liked it, but they said, it's got some fault. And um, this, uh, the cook, his name was Dr. Cook, he said, no, it's not, it's perfect. And his followers were like, no, we can change it. And they had this back and forth until there was a split and Logland became Lodgeman, which is what you see when you hear logical languages nowadays, it's mostly talking about Lodgeman. I'm gonna take a short digression to explain excisely, precisely what I mean by a logical language. In a logical language, you can be wrong. You can have flaws in your logic. Uh, you can express emotion. So uh, it's, it doesn't, it's not necessarily, you know, like math, you know what I mean? But the thing is, when in English you say, I saw the man with binoculars, you don't know if you're the one with the binoculars or if you're seeing someone with binoculars. Uh, am I explaining myself? So uh, when, so, but in Lodgman, it is impossible to have anything with a syntactical ambiguity like that. In, lo in Lodgman, you can try all night to try and have a confusing sentence where you don't know who has the binoculars, and you're not gonna get there because of the way that it is built. Um, and I think the best way to explain this is with an example. Uh, Alice in Wonderland, I don't know if you knew this, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician, so it was one of the first works translated into Lodgman because of its basis on symbolic logic and on linguistic uh, ideas. So, Here's one. Take some more tea, said the March Hare, or very earnestly. I've had nothing yet, Alice replied in an offended tone, so I can't take more. You mean you can't take less, said the Hatter. You, it's very easy to take more than nothing. Um, now let's look at, I, I found a Lodgeman translation and I translated it to the best of my ability back into English using a dictionary, and this is what it says. Make it true for you to increase the ordinal number, not, not the cardinal number, the ordinal number of times you drink the tea. The one called March Hare said seriously to the one called Alice. I have drank something zero times, said the one called Alice with emotional pain. <laughs> Log logically, I do not have the innate capacity to increase the ordinal number of times I have done the preceding statement. <laughs> you intend to say to predication that you have no ca capacity to decrease the ordinal number of times you have drunk something, said the one called the Hatter. The event of increasing the preceding statement from the zeroth time is easy. So, 
if you've ever enjoyed a logic puzzle in your life, like if you if you were one of those that played, you know, like the towers of um, it, like like if you did crossword puzzles as a kid, do not look into Logic Man. It is a dangerous language. You are gonna be stuck there for hours. Um, uh, Rika Orant, who wrote a book on Logic Man and all languages like this, she said that it's meaning quicksand. It is a perfect description. You knock something loose, and like 20 other predicates come out whenever you're trying to deal with this language. Um, and I was, there were times when I was like, who in their right mind so would sit down and try to learn Logic Man? But the more I looked at it, the more I noticed a certain sense of aesthetic beauty to it. Because every word is so fact with meaning and is so absolutely precise. It's like the platonic ideal of what language should be. It's, it's impossible to like say something like, say something that you don't mean. Um, but it's also so frustrating for that, right? Large man did not pick up. And the same ideal came later to something called link cost. Uh, I'm not going to read this because I don't know how to read this. Um, but basically, it's a language assigned for communication with extraterrestrials. Um, and it has to be perfectly logical because when you're dealing with another species, you don't know how their brain works, you don't know their cognitive capacities, and you don't know if they have the same biases that we do, right? In the same way that we don't have the same biases that Wilkins did. Um, so you have to be as, as based on mathematics as possible because if there's one thing we ha we're going to have in common with an intelligent species, it's going to be mathematics because otherwise we wouldn't be talking, right? So um, it's entirely based on math, but it's also 600 pages of a language that we're probably never going to get to use. Like no alien ever is going to look at this. I'm pretty sure, like I'm pretty sure that this is not going to happen. So in a sense, I feel like the language isn't so much built for extraterrestrials as it's built for us. Um, and the reason for this is because it's, it's the same sort of categorizing impulse that you see in Genesis, in the Bible, and the same categorizing impulse you see in Wilkins, and the same impulse you see in Lodgeman and Logland, um, and in the Caracteristica Universalis of Leibniz. Um, it's, th there's a need, a very human need, to have things make sense. But, we, but these languages don't catch on, you know. Esperanto has over 200 native speakers. That one was made up. Uh, in a couple of months, you're going to be able to learn Klingon, of all languages, Klingon on Duolingo. Um, but not Lodgeman, right? Um, so the, the, why hasn't it caught up? And I think it's because we like ambiguity. Um, I think it's because we, we, don't know, we don't know what we're thinking a lot of the time or we know, but we can't express it exactly the way we do, and we need that safety net, right? Um, although it generates some miscommunications and so, and so on, it allows us to have any communication at all, because it's very hard to communicate yourself completely in, in large man, as I've, I'm very well aware of now. Um, so I'm gonna close up with another quote from the same essay from of Jorge Luis Borges, um, which I think encapsulates more or less what I'm trying to get at. There's no classification of the universe that is not arbitrary and conjectural. The reason for this is very simple. We don't know what matter of a thing the universe is. Thank you.